to do it. So Janet, can you come up and uh, just use the light to here. Good morning. It's not often I get the invitation to make a date with a lot of people. Um, but BUS, which is the Baptist Union for Scotland, are rolling out their canopy autumn, which is on Friday the 27th of October. And some of the Baptist churches in Scotland have been asked to host uh, the event. And here at KBC, we are hosting um, as one of the, the event, as one of the leaders. Um, the AV team will be available for doing the online. And it is known as national prayer gathering so we would like as many as possible to come along on the 27th at 7 p.m to get a cup of tea and a wee natter and then go into prayer groups um, for the event at 7 30. you're all warmly welcome we know that here at kbc we have a lot of prayer warriors so we'd like to invite you along there's never been a, a time more than now when we need national prayer. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Now, we are very thankful to God for all the children that we have here. You guys are going to be heading out to your own things in a minute. Um, so uh, that's everybody up to uh, primary seven is going to be heading out. The youth use S1's on. You guys are going to be staying in the service today. Um, so let me pray for you kids just before you go out. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for our children, for we know that they are a blessing from you. We thank you for those who will lead them now as they teach them. Father, we pray for all of them, Father, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, and that they would know your ways that they would go in the path everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the kids will be heading out. I encourage you to speak to those around you uh, and share fellowship with them. And then Marjorie will come up afterwards.
there has to be a time that uh, all the chatter has to stop. And that time is Ooh, now. <laughs> Many people uh, asked when the, the whole situation in Israel and Gaza developed last week um, about Moira Leng. And at that time she was in India, but came home from India on uh, Tuesday and was to have been going to Gaza in a couple of weeks. Um, she'll be here next week, but we asked her if she would be willing to um, talk a little about uh, the situation and the people that she's been in touch with. And so before we pray, um, she is going to uh, speak to us through this video. Alan Donaldson has also sent various items for prayer, which I think are on the bulletin this week. Uh, and as we pray as Christians for that situation, then these things can all help inform us and help, help us. But before we pray, let's look at Moira's message. Uh, greetings to our church family. I'm so sorry I can't be with you today. And thank you to the very many people who've been in touch to ask um, if I'm safe, but also about uh, the people that we work with and serve. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I'm at a conference in Oxford. I'll be back next weekend. I'll be in church next weekend. And we'll also be sharing more at our Carlos gathering on Saturday, the 21st. It's, it's hard for me to talk this morning. It's hard to uh, find words um, uh, to talk about the situation that is playing out now in, in the beautiful Holy Land in, in Gaza, uh, in West Bank and in Israel. And I would have been there in 10 days time. We would have been graduating our first diploma students. There was a lot of excitement and a lot of joy and anticipation. And I mean, my first reaction, I think, as most of us, is to feel overwhelmed by the level of suffering that we're seeing, uh, to think of uh, what happened in Israel, those young people and the elderly and those who died attending a music festival or living in their kibbutz and those who held hostage. And, um, and our heart bleeds and we mourn for the suffering there. And we also mourn for what we see now of a response which goes above and beyond what is anything I could imagine in terms of the destruction of Gaza. And I'm going to share something of what our students are feeding back to us. But you'll be aware that the, they are now uh, existing without water and without electricity and without food. And there is no humanitarian corridor as such, even though that is required under international law. I think the first response is of lament um, and to crying out to God on behalf of all of those who are suffering. But with that sense that God hears and knows and that sense that Jesus died for the suffering in this world. And that gives us hope in the midst of suffering. I wanted also just to share with you just some of the things that people are sharing with me for us to be able to pray and understand more. One of the first people I reached out to was a colleague who's an Israeli palliative care doctor, whose home I, I, I shared Shabbat with uh, when I was there last, whose daughter I knew lived and worked in a kibbutz that was affected. And I'm very glad to say that she's safe, um, but many, many, many of the people she knows, of course, are not. And, and, and he responded and said that he felt outraged, sad, and deeply concerned for our future. And some of you know that I've often talked of and others talk of the fact that, that Israel can only be safe if there's peace on her borders. And that lack of peace for so many years is just so devastating and we see, we see some of that now. Our students are, are desperate. They're trying to get to hospital and work. Uh, our colleagues are sharing some of what's happening. I, I actually was on a call with our colleague and I could see the bombs falling and his children crying and the scale of the damage is almost unimaginable. Um, uh, Camus actually said to me that he condemned killing of every kind, including what had happened in Israel. But he said, punish those who involved and not innocent civilians. The hospitals are full, 
the other study is running out, which means um, neonates on ventilators. It means uh, the sick who are awaiting surgery will not be cared for and medical supplies are running out and as yet none have been allowed in. Um, there's also been just very moving messages. Some students saying goodbye, saying that they hold us in their hearts. Um, and that's very difficult uh, to read, as you can imagine. Um, let me quote from one of our senior pharmacists. She told me, Gaza, the beautiful city which you know has become a city of ghosts. We ask, we ask no more than life with peace and dignity, like all people all over the world, and to be considered human beings. And I think that's where I, I really would love to just to focus on that all involved are human beings made in the image of God and that God cares deeply for all who are suffering, particularly those who are caught up as innocent civilians in war. I've been uh, reading a lot from different sources. I know the Baptist Union shares their sources, but I found that Bethlehem Bible College communications particularly helpful. And um, they run a lot of, of, of courses and writings about how to live um, lives of love under occupation, how to love your enemies, how to um, seek peace with justice. So I want to just quote uh, a couple of their prayers. And they start off quoting, um, and I'll share this, I'll share this for those who would like to know more from there. Um, but they talk about quoting, God is our strength and refuge. And, I, and that is very much my prayer for ourselves as we live through this at a distance, but most of all for our, our brothers and sisters and for every person involved in Gaza and Israel. They also ask us to pray for leaders and decision makers that they may be inspired by wisdom, compassion and a desire for peace. They ask us to pray that God's love and peace may transcend the divisions and hatred that have plagued this region for so long. Pray also to help us to be instruments of his peace, promoting justice, understanding, reconciliation and mostly most importantly, a just peace in the Holy Land. And we also lift up the families and individuals affected by the conflict, those who have lost loved ones, homes and livelihoods. And I would add, please do continue to pray for our colleagues, for our students, um, and do pray that the madness of this collective carpet bombing in Gaza would cease and that there would be out of this disaster and horror, they would be peacemakers uh, that God raises up. And thank you for your prayers. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, our hearts are heavy as we come to you with our prayers, and yet we know that despite our circumstances and all we see around us, your love does not change. We thank you too that your word tells us to cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. <clears throat> you love the world so much that you sent your son to save us. We pray for all those affected by the current situation in Israel and Gaza. We deplore the violent loss of life and the taking of hostages. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who are injured, those who have lost homes, and for those worried about loved ones held as hostages or trapped in Gaza. We cry out to you too for those who have had to flee their homes, those in hospitals, those whose supplies of food and water are running out. We pray for leaders and decision makers both here and throughout the region, that they may be inspired by wisdom, justice, compassion, and a desire for peace. We pray that God's love may transcend the divisions and hatred that have plagued this region for so long. <clears throat> and as we pray for the Middle East, we pray too for Ukraine, and ask that there too you would bring comfort to those who are injured, to those who mourn, and to all who are worried about what the future holds. We pray for those who have come as refugees to the UK, not just from Ukraine, but from many other regions where there is conflict. 
We ask you to bless the work of Paul and Emma Wilson as they engage with refugees here in Glasgow. <clears throat> we pray for our own governments, both in Westminster and at Holyrood, and ask that they too would be wise and compassionate in the decisions they make. And give us wisdom to hold them to account when there are issues which concern us. We pray particularly today for our First Minister and his wife's family and for others who are stranded in Gaza. We pray for the Jewish community here in the UK who are worried for their friends and relatives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As this holiday week begins, we thank you that some have been able to get away and we pray that they will have a refreshing break. We pray too for those for whom this is a stressful time and ask that you would uphold them. <clears throat> we pray for all our students starting new terms and thank you for the teachers and lecturers who are part of KBC. We thank you, Lord, for our staff team and we rejoice with Rob, Lisa and Ada on the birth of Josiah. Bless that little family, we pray. Be with Mark and Sarah and the boys on holiday, and we pray for happy family time together. We remember Ailey and Cam, and thank you for all they mean to us. Give them a sense of your peace as they prepare to move south. Thank you, Lord, for Craig's appointment, and we pray for him as he gets to know and encourage the staff and volunteers and clients in the food bank, CAP, and the Greenhouse Cafe. And for Dave, as he gets to know the congregation and shares the load of teaching and pastoral care with Mark and Anne. We bring before you the vacancies and pray that at this time of transition, you would bind together the whole staff team in unity and purpose. Father, you know each one of us, and in a moment of silence, we bring before you our joys and concerns for our own families and friends. For those listed in the bulletin, Jeanette Matheson, Liz Irvin, Nan McCaffrey, Ali Primrose, Jean Handling, Jean McClucky, Linda Horn, Martin Wilson, Tom Fabling, and the Hogg family. We thank you too for the fellowship that we share Sunday by Sunday with those, not, with those watching us online. May they know your love and blessing as they watch. And for those of our church family who are housebound or in care homes, we ask that they too would be very aware of your presence and your love today. We thank you too for the fellowship we share with our mission partners. And we pray particular today for Moira in her distress over the situation in Gaza. And we remember her colleagues and students, as well as her Israeli friends. We think of Elizabeth, also saddened by the events there and knowing many of those students. And we pray for her in Albania just now, that you would give her strength for all she has to do there. We remember Robert Meikle as he comes to the UK and asks that this would be a useful visit for him. <clears throat> Lord, we think too of Tear Fund partners and others who are dealing with and trying to help the victims of the earthquake in Afghanistan. And we would not forget those who are still living with the consequences of the earthquake in Morocco and the floods in Libya. Father, give them strength for their efforts. We pray for our other mission partners too, Lord, and you know all their needs. And so we lift them to you today, as well as those who in the UK are supporting missions from here. Help us to encourage each of them in whatever ways we can. Help us too to listen and to encourage each other in our work and other activities that we're involved in this week. 
and be with us as we bring you our praise. Thank you for Dave leading us in worship and for Dave sharing your word with us. We ask, Lord, that through all of that, we would draw closer to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. In case any of you are concerned, I'm not bringing you the sermon this morning. <laughs> Other day. Um, <laughs> yes, for Christians all across the world who are struggling, the truths that Christ's sacrifice will carry us safe across eternity's shore are beautiful truths uh, that we can hold on to. And we're going to sing about that just now. And He will hold me fast. It talks about when we fear our faith will fail that Christ will hold us fast, and it talks of the cost at which our lives were bought at the cross. So let's stand and let's sing of these beautiful truths.
O great faithful God, we praise you that you were, are able to carry us to eternity's shore, safe amidst the trouble and the tribulation and the toil. Father, we know that your promises shall ring true, that you will hold us fast. Father, as Dave opens your word with us this morning, we pray that you would speak to us through him. Father, that his words of truth and of boldness from your word will so change our hearts by your spirit that we can't but glorify you, that we can't but trust you more. Father, would you be glorified in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. Do have a seat. Pressure pushing down on me, pressing down on you, no man ask for. Under pressure that brings a building down, splits a family in two, puts people on streets. That's the terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching some good friends screaming, let me out. Pray tomorrow gets me higher. Words written by Queen and David Bowie back in the 1980s. Under pressure, in which they sing of the unrelenting pressures of life. But it's quite a dark and depressing song, because even though at the end they have some vague hope that love will somehow get them through, there is no real sense that there's a solution for the pressures that we face in life. We've been thinking this morning, haven't we, and praying for some of the situations in the world where there is extreme pressure on people, on nations, on the innocent. And maybe you know of people whose lives are under great pressure because of the, the faith they have in Jesus and the stance they make for the Lord here in Scotland and also in other parts of the world. Well, Paul knew what it was to be under pressure. In the letter to the church in Corinth that we call 2 Corinthians, he wrote, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself, as he reflects on his experience and his missionary work. Later in the letter, he explains more about those pressures that he and his team faced. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned struck down, but not destroyed. Living for Jesus, speaking up for Jesus, and testifying to the truth of the gospel of Jesus has never been easy. But Paul was convinced that being treated in this way, hard-pressed, crushed, persecuted, and struck down, he was convinced that being treated in that way was worth it. He'd sum it up by saying, this is like being given over to death, but it was worth it for Jesus' sake. It was worth it for the sake of the church. It was worth it because of the eternal glory that far outweighed any of these light and momentary troubles. I look at Paul's life sometimes, and I think, how can he describe what happened to him as light and momentary troubles? But that was his perspective. He knew it was worth it because what he was doing was, was so valuable in the lives of the people he shared the gospel with and the churches that he planted and strengthened. It was worth it. But it's hard, isn't it? Because there are times when the, the troubles that we face or the troubles that we see in the lives of others, they don't feel light, and sometimes they don't feel momentary. They, they threaten to crush us, to squeeze the life out of us. And sometimes they last for what seems like an age. So how did Paul cope? How could he write these things? And what hope is there for us 
when we feel hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. Well, as we look at what happened to Paul in Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, there's much we can learn from the way he responded under pressure. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the uh, fight or flight response, that physiological response that we're told um, happens when we're in a threatening situation. Sometimes, or, or some of us, are, um, our instinct is to react or resist forcibly, and some of us prefer the option of running away, fight or flight. But I think in the passage today, we're going to see three responses to the pressure that comes with being a Christian. There's flight, and there's rights, and there's fight. Paul is told to walk away from one situation. There's another where he claims his legal rights. And finally, he makes a stand for the gospel, even though he's under great pressure. And all three are valid responses because the Lord is in all three of them, all these different ways to respond to pressure. So we're going to look this morning at these three things. When we're under pressure, we can take counsel, we can take cover, most importantly of all, we can take courage. Now, quick recap, because it's a couple of weeks since we were in Acts. Paul had arrived in Jerusalem expecting trouble. Do you remember a few weeks ago, Agabus, the prophet, came and said that the Jews would bind him and hand him over to the Gentiles, and his friends were trying to persuade him not to go to Jerusalem because of this anticipated struggle. And Paul said, no, no, I'm going because God has called me there. Well, those prophecies were coming true. And two weeks ago, we saw how a mob seized Paul convinced that he had defiled the Jewish holy place by bringing Gentiles into the temple area. And the mob dragged him out of the temple and began beating him viciously. Luke tells us in Acts 21, that 31 that uh, they were trying to kill him. And they probably would have done if the Roman commander hadn't intervened. But Paul wanted to speak to the crowd. He wanted to defend himself, to tell his story. And a silence fell as he began to speak to the crowd in Aramaic, their own language. He told them of his background, of how he had grown up in Jerusalem and become the leading Pharisee of his day, the religious teacher that everyone respected. And he was zealous for God, so much so that he persecuted the church, and he went around throwing Christians into prison until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, an encounter that changed everything. Well, today we pick up the story in Acts 22, where Paul, still speaking to the crowd, continues to tell his testimony. When I returned to Jerusalem, says Paul, and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw the Lord speaking to me, quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away. To the Gentiles. Paul is counseled by the Lord to do something quite unusual, I think. Maybe something that we wouldn't think he would do to walk away. You may have heard the expression, I was trying to think where I've heard it recently in a, in a movie or a show or something. He who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. Have you ever heard that? Apparently, uh, this dates back to 338 BC, uh, when an Athenian um, orator and statesman who had been a soldier, Demosthenes, remember that name, he was an infantryman and he was fighting in the army. Um, and there was this big battle between the Athenians and the Macedonians, and the Macedonians were victorious. Over 3,000 of the Athenian army died, and Demosthenes fled from the battlefield 
and he was subsequently censured because of his desertion. But to anyone who later called him a coward, Demosthenes would say, the man who runs away may fight again. Hence the, the saying, he who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. Now, although we know that living for Jesus in a hostile world will bring its challenges, Jesus himself promised that in this world we will have trouble, there are times when it's appropriate to walk away. That's what Jesus told Paul to do in this story. Now, he was in Jerusalem about three years after his conversion, so quite early on in his Christian life, and he wanted to go and tell his story to the Jews, just like he was doing um, at the time of our story today. But Jesus said, leave Jerusalem because the people will not accept you or your testimony. And Paul pushed back. Did you see that? He wanted to give it a go. He thought that they were bound to listen to him because he'd been one of them. He was one of them. But Jesus said, no, and go. Now, a couple of weeks ago in the evening service, we looked at how Jesus sent the 12 disciples out on their first mission trip. And he said to them, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. You give it a go. You share the message. You do your best. But if there's rejection... It's okay to walk away, shake the dust off your feet to say, I've done my best to tell you about Jesus and walk away. We see Paul doing that on several occasions in his missionary journeys. You've probably seen that as you've been through the book of Acts. Sometimes he would preach, they would, they would, they would seize him, they would beat him. There was one time he was left for dead, but God protected him. Paul picked himself up and he went on to the next place. What I love about Paul, and I think we see this in the disciples as well, we'll maybe see this later in Mark, is that when they left and shook the dust off their feet, when Paul picked himself up and went on from wherever it was that had rejected him, he would often go back later. So on his second and third journeys, Paul often visits the same places that had rejected him before, and maybe the gospel has taken root, maybe a church has been planted. And Paul is able to share there and strengthen the believers. Walking away doesn't mean that you necessarily abandon those people or that situation or that mission forever. But it is an appropriate response if the Lord is in it. And so we need wisdom when we're under pressure. In the words of another song, should I stay or should I go? Is the Lord asking me to, to struggle through? Or is he actually saying, it's okay, leave and maybe come back later? It's what Jesus said to Paul, go to the Gentiles. Go somewhere else. Try something else. And sometimes the Lord has plans for us that are not the plans that we thought that he had for us. And he might say, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. I don't want you to go there. I want you to stay and be faithful here. So Paul left. And here we are now, 20 years later, and Paul has come back to Jerusalem to give it another go. But sadly, the Jews in Jerusalem were still not ready to accept his testimony. And when he got to the bit about telling how Jesus had said to him to go to the Gentiles, they erupt once more. Cue Bedlam. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? 
When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. The commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The first response is to take counsel. The second is to take cover under the protection of the law. Now, over the last few years, we've seen a, a few incidences of opposition to the presence of Scripture Union groups in our schools here in Scotland. It's not widespread, but it does happen. And when it does, we and our volunteers and our staff in SU need wisdom from God to know what to do. We can take the group out with the school and hold it in a local church, an out-of-school SU group. We walk away. But there is another option, and that is to claim our right to have a Christian group in the school, especially where every other interest group are treated with great favor and value. This happened a few years ago in Edinburgh, where the staff member suggested to the head teacher, who was saying that the SU group wasn't welcome, that um, that could be, dis could be regarded as discriminatory. And that was the word to use. As soon as the D word was mentioned, everything changed. And the head teacher was like, oh, well, in that case, no. No, you come in as well. Because, you know, every group has a meeting, and it's okay for you to have a meeting too. Talk a lot about being PC in our world today. Do you know there's a PC, protected characteristics? And sometimes we can claim our rights to have a Christian group in our school because faith is a protected characteristic. Now, I think Paul knew when to take cover behind the law. The crowd are baying for Paul's blood once more. They're shouting, they're throwing off their cloaks, flinging dust into the air. It's like a triple whammy of aggressive, murderous, threatening behavior. Do you remember the crowd taking their coats off before they stoned Stephen? They're shouting, who knows what they were calling him. Um, and it's like there are no stones to, you know, murder Paul, and so they start flinging dust in the air, or maybe they were scared because the Roman soldiers were still there. Whatever it was, they were flinging stuff in the air as though they were trying to kill Paul once more. And in steps the commander. Paul is taken to the barracks, and, and the poor commander, uh, he has no idea what's going on, he almost certainly wouldn't have understood Aramaic, and so he couldn't hear what Paul had been saying to the crowd. He just doesn't know why Paul is suddenly public enemy number one. And so he wants to find out. And the way you got that information as a Roman commander was through torture. And so was that the hideous whip that they used for a flogging was being prepared and Paul is stretched out probably between two posts with his back to the whip, ready to be beaten. He looks up and he asks the centurion next to him, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen? Cue bedlam of a totally different kind. The centurion runs off to find the commander. Did you know that this guy's a Roman citizen? And the commander runs to Paul and says, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes. And all of a sudden, everything changes, and he's released. The whip is returned to its case. The Inquisition team disappear, and the commander speaks with Paul once more. And what we see here, I think, is that Paul knew his rights, and that on this occasion, he exercised those rights in order to what could have been a lethal flogging. Remember, Paul's just been nearly beaten to death already. Well, what were his rights? Well, there were three laws I read this week, the Lex Valeria, the Lex Porcia, and the Lex Julia. And these rights prohibited the beating and even the chaining of Roman citizens and gave citizens in the provinces the right to appeal to Rome. So Paul knew 
his rights. But what fascinates me is that Paul didn't always do this. Again, think back in your studies in Acts. What happened in Philippi? In Philippi, Paul and Silas were flogged and thrown into jail. And while they were in jail, they were singing hymns and, and praying and praising God, and God opened the jail up, and the jailer became a Christian. It was pretty amazing. But at the end of that story, as the magistrates came and said, well, we'd like you to leave quietly now, please, Paul said, no, I'm a Roman citizen. And they were absolutely terrified because of what they'd done to him. But why didn't Paul claim his right as a Roman citizen before he was flogged and thrown in jail? That time he chose not to. This time he chooses to avoid the beating. Now, in our modern world where people are passionate about all sorts of rights, human rights, children's rights, animal rights, all sorts of rights, it's unthinkable, isn't it, to us that Paul wouldn't claim his right to be treated fairly. But that's what he did in Philippi. And he would waive other rights during his ministry as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he writes about how he gave up his rights as an apostle. Why? Well, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ, he said. And I think that Paul waived his rights as a Roman citizen in Philippi because he believed that to claim his rights at that point would hinder the gospel. And he was proved right, wasn't he? Because the jailer and his family came to faith. God's power was demonstrated. But in Jerusalem, he claimed those rights because possibly the flogging would have killed him. And that certainly would have hindered the gospel because Paul believed that he had more work to do. Now, this has all made me think, what rights do we cling to? The right to an easy life, a higher standard of living than we really need? And do we hinder the gospel of Christ by claiming our rights? It may just be that our being different in the way that we live and the rights that we claim speaks more powerfully than any evangelistic message we could give to our friends and colleagues. But I also think that in an ever increasingly difficult and hostile world, our society today here in Scotland, it's good for us to know our rights, to think about how we might respond if we're excluded from things, from places, activities, whatever it is, because of our faith in Jesus, because of our belief in the Bible. But it's also important, isn't it, for us to know when we should exercise those rights. And again, we need wisdom. We need wisdom to decide whether we should stay or whether we should go. We need wisdom to know whether we should exercise our rights or turn the other cheek, as Jesus said. But ultimately, of course, our cover is provided by God. Psalm 91 tells us that we find refuge under His wings as He covers us with His feathers. So whatever's going on in our lives, we can take refuge under God's wings. And that leads us on to our final thought. Sometimes, having taken wise counsel, the thing to do is to leave. Sometimes, Responding to the wisdom of Jesus, we can claim our rights and take cover. But always, God is with us, covering us, so that we can take courage. Here's what happens at the end of our story this morning. The commander still doesn't know. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and set him before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, 
God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I didn't realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees, and I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Take courage. When we were um, with OMF in Cambodia, um, we would often have a, a, what we call a pre-home assignment workshop. So before you came home to tell the, the stories and to report back and to thank people for their prayers, you had a, a, a week or two just to, to get your story straight, as it were, to think, what has God done? What am I going to share? What are the amazing things? What are the challenges? And one of the, the story sets that we would put together um, was called, Was It Worth It All? Was it worth it all? And there were various things that we had experienced. There were various things that our Cambodian brothers and sisters had experienced that were, we would say, yes, it's worth it. It's worth being hard-pressed for the sake of the gospel. Even small things like, you know, it rained a lot last weekend and there was lots of flooding. That used to happen all the time in Phnom Penh, especially in the rainy season, as you can imagine. The monsoon rains, the, the floods would come up. We'd still have to get about, and often the motorbike would, would not work properly. The water was so deep, the water would get into the exhaust pipe. So out comes the bicycle, and you're cycling along the road through all this dirty water, and there's a rat swimming in front of you, and a rat swimming behind you. And you think, do you enjoy your job in Cambodia? <laughs> no, but it's worth it. It's worth it to see the church grow. It's worth it to see people become Christians even small inconveniences like that. Paul knew it was worth it. But his appearance before the Sanhedrin is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's totally fascinating. Uh, for one thing, it was the commander who called the Sanhedrin together, which is probably not the done thing. But again, he wants to know what's going on, and so he calls the religious leaders to assemble. And then we have Paul being struck on the mouth, and the apostle appearing to lose his temper and then apologizing before putting an enormous cat amongst a very agitated group of pigeons by talking about the resurrection of the dead, and the assembly is divided. And I think the key elements of this dramatic scene are first that Paul claimed to be innocent of the original accusation that he'd taken a Gentile into the temple, and so his conscience was clear. And secondly, that no one appeared inclined to believe him, and therefore he wasn't going to get a fair trial. Now, the other thing to notice is that Paul didn't just know his Roman law, he knew his Jewish law. And he said, oh yeah, I'm sorry if I've insulted the high priest, because I know it says in, in Leviticus or in Exodus, uh, you shouldn't speak evil of the ruler of your people. But when Paul was struck, he was upset because they had broken God's law. It was unlawful for somebody to be struck like that, in, in a sense to be, to be sentenced. It's like the decision's already been made before he'd even had his trial. 
And that's why Paul called Ananias a whitewashed wall, which is just a metaphor for a hypocrite. And when Paul realizes that it's the high priest, he's, he's apologetic, I think. Now, it's interesting that Paul didn't recognize the high priest who'd given the order, perhaps because, um, quite famously, Paul had bad eyesight um, and he, he couldn't see who it was, maybe because the assembly was gathered together so quickly that the high priest didn't have time to put on all his robes that would have made it obvious who he was. But I like the idea that Paul was kind of being a little bit sarcastic in his response here. I did not think that a man who could give such an order to strike an innocent, hasn't had his trial yet, man on the mouth, could be the high priest. I didn't think he could be the high priest. Now, Ananias was one of the most corrupt men ever to be named high priest. Uh, Warren Wiersbe in his commentary says this, he stole tithes from the other priests, and he did all he could do to increase his authority. He was known as a brutal man who cared more for Rome's favor than Israel's welfare. Paul knew he wasn't going to get a fair trial. And I wonder if it was that that caused Paul to begin this contentious speech about the resurrection of the dead. Was this a way of bringing the whole charade to an end? Or maybe Paul genuinely wanted to preach the hope of the gospel to these religious leaders. Well, whatever his motives, the result was a divided assembly. It was, in fact, another riot. And some of the Pharisees even sided with Paul. Did you notice that? Well, maybe he has had an angel or somebody speak to him. Maybe we should listen to what he has to say. But God provides this guardian angel once more. And I think for the third time in this story, the Roman commander rescues Paul from the crowd. God does that sometimes. He provides the most unlikely people to help us when we need it most. Um, the guy in the middle um, here is Socs et uh, That's me in a suit. At the, the only time I wore a suit was when I went to get the uh, agreements with the Cambodian government um, ratified. Um, and just this side of Soxita is Somalai, who is our uh, staff uh, member in, in Cambodia. We had a period in 2010 where we were really struggling to get our agreements with the government renewed so that we could do both uh, church planting and church strengthening work as well as humanitarian work in Cambodia. And we really didn't know where to turn. We were just getting blanked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we needed help with the Ministry of Religion. And then a friend of a friend of a friend appears out of nowhere, um, and this man smoothed away for us and opened the possibility of getting our agreements signed. And that's the day we signed them. From nowhere, this guy appeared, um, and he helped us. And God does that sometimes. Not even a Christian but able to help us, like the commander in Paul's story. Now, once everything had quietened down and the dust had settled on that day in Jerusalem, and Paul is asleep, or well, maybe he's awake thinking about all that's happened, the Lord stood near and said to him, take courage. In some translations, it says, be of good cheer, which is a remarkable thing to say when you've been through all that Paul has just been through. Take courage. Now, Paul, you know those words I started with from 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote that letter probably two years before his experiences in this story. Almost like Jesus was saying, take courage. You remember that thing you wrote two years ago? You're being persecuted, but you're not abandoned. I am here with you. And Jesus, of course, is with us always. That's what he promised when he sent the disciples out to make disciples of all nations. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It's a final special encouragement for Paul. Take courage. But not just that. Jesus says, 
it's going to be okay because I need you to testify for me in Rome as well. And I think then Paul knew that until he got to Rome and testified about Jesus in front of Caesar, maybe, certainly the Roman authorities, he was going to be safe. Still challenges, but ultimately safe. So whatever we're facing, whatever those that you pray for in other parts of the world are facing at the moment, whether they be hard-pressed, whether they be perplexed, whether they be persecuted, or whether they're being struck down, we can take courage because Jesus is with them. Jesus is with us. Yeah, it might be appropriate to take counsel and to think, do I need to lay that aside? Do I need to walk away? And it's good to take cover if that is what the God is prompting us to do with our rights. But whatever happens, know this. Jesus stands near you. Jesus stands near us and says, take courage. I've got work for you to do yet until the ends of the earth have heard the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for those of us this morning who feel hard-pressed on every side. Would you remind us again and protect us again so that we are not crushed? Lord, I pray for any of us this morning who are perplexed. We just can't see what to do. Lord, save us from despair and by your Holy Spirit, inspire us with wisdom to know what to do. Lord, for those who are persecuted, for those of us who are facing a tough time, may we know this morning that we are not abandoned, that you're with us and will always be with us. And Lord, if we've been struck down, if we feel like we're on the floor today, help us to know that we're not destroyed, but also that you will pick us up and strengthen us for the days ahead. We thank you, Lord, for the way you help Paul, and we trust that you will help us the same way as we live for you. Amen. I'll stand and we'll sing as we close. For we know that we can sing with joy, uh, for God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? He will not abandon. He will not forsake. Let's stand and let's sing.
great God, we praise you and we magnify your name, the creator of the universe who flung stars into space and created our innermost being, sending Jesus in the perfect time as our Savior. Oh God, our helper, Father, we pray that you would help us to take courage this day, that we would know that you won't abandon us, that you won't forsake us, but that you will walk by our side. Help us, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Now, we do hope that you'll join us. Uh, We have our prayer gathering tonight at 6 o'clock up in the upper room. Um, uh, So that's at 6 o'clock. And then our evening service, of course, uh, tonight at 7. Now, Uh, We thank you for being with us this morning. Let me read uh, just finally from Ephesians 3, final words of benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever 
and ever. Amen. God bless.